Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity to interact with you. Thank you for the organizers for having inviting me. My name is Manuel Guerrero. Uh, my background is in sociology and applied ethics. Um, I am based at Uppsala University in Sweden. Um, I am assistant professor in bioethics and medical humanities at the University of Chile. And I am part of the, one of the sub-projects um, that we have already seen, sub-project 12, which has to do with ethics and society. And I will talk about that I use an ethical awareness in the Human Brain Project. My intention is to first describe a little bit the Human Brain Project from their data sharing perspective, and uh, then to, um, to show you the different ethics governance structures that we have in the Human Brain Project, and specifically how we manage the different data use and ethical issues in the project. Please feel free to interrupt me with quest questions. We can open a dialogue, or we can talk at, at, um, at the end of the presentation. As we have already seen in the different moments of this workshop, um, the multiscale brain, the complexity of the brain, um, impose several challenges uh, from the scientific perspective and from, from a technological perspective. Understanding the brain requires an integrated understanding in different scales of organizations. We have seen from genes, channel cells, microcircuits, networks, brain regions, the whole brain. And if we, um, if we want, want to, we have to understand the brain not only embedded in the body, as we have already seen, but also interacting with the environment, with the social and the cultural environment. So the, this, this is a challenge. The complexity of the brain poses a very, very huge challenge, scientific challenge. And uh, to understand the different levels, time scales of the brain. And for doing that, we uh, use in, in brain research, uh, in, in those different levels of the brain, different type of data. We use different type of models, tools, and techniques and uh, that's something that different brain, big brain research projects are doing now, trying to integrate those different time, per sc time and scales uh, through the integration of different type of data. So understanding the brain uh, implies a scientific and technologi techni technical challenges to bridging the different scales in space and time to understand the architecture and the function of the brain. Technical challenges that has to do with the integration of the, the different type of data sets that we have. And, uh, and for doing this, uh, we have different uh, big, large, neuro, so-called neuro ICT research project now. Uh, this is an, an image from the Global Neuroethics Society uh, from the last summit the last year, where uh, different regions of the world are participating with their own initiatives. The Brain Initiative in the US, Canada, in China, Korea, Japan, Australia. But we know that there are also other brain uh, big research projects, not so huge like those ones, but we have also uh, some in, in Cuba and in different countries. And um, those different large brain uh, research projects are now collaborating. So the collaboration is crucial for understanding now the brain. But it poses a very huge challenge now how to share data from different parts of the world, from different cultures, from different uh, modus operandi, from different standards, ethical and legal standards. So understanding the brain um, needs an integration and to share data, as we have seen in the last uh, in the last session. Here is an HBP at a glance. Uh, the Human Brain Project is one of those big research projects. And uh, this is information from um, October, November uh, 2018. As we have, have heard, now there are 131 partners. Uh, but I wanted to show you that in the Human Brain Project, there are participating 19 countries, each of them with their own uh, legal frameworks within Europe and also with non-EU countries. 
Uh, we have spoken uh, about Brexit with the UK, but we are also interacting with, um, with Israel and other, um, with, uh, Norway, uh, Switzerland, and other countries. Um, more than 100 institutions, um, thousands of hospitals, different type of disciplines. So that's, not only the brain is complex, but the Human Brain Project in itself, within the, the Human Brain Project, it's a complex project. Um, and that raised different type of ethical challenges, not only scientific and technical, but also legal, social, and ethical. Here is a, a, a um, highlight overview of the Human Brain Project. As we have seen, we have this different multi-scale in space and time, uh, a multimodality uh, in, in this effort to understand the brain and its structure and function uh, from, from genes to behavior, uh, from molecules to society. And, uh, and we have already seen as well, uh, in the Human Brain Projects, we have a part that has to do with basic neuroscientific research uh, which is working, doing research with animal models or with um, human participants. And, but we also have um, six research platforms that has to do with, uh, with um, informatics, neuroinformatics, with simulation, with robotics. And we have targeted research that has to do with social and ethical um, research. So, if the brain is complex, the Human Brain Project is complex as well. Not only because this huge organization and participation of multiple uh, countries, but also because it's an interdisciplinary effort. And doing uh, interdiscipline is always a big challenge because we, com we are coming from different disciplinary cultures. So in addition to the scientific challenges, we have ethical challenges in the Human Brain Project. We are doing inter interdisciplinary research, linking neuroscience, brain medicine, computer science, social science, and humanities. Um, and from an ethical perspective, that means that we have different professional deontologies. Each of our disciplines and, pr and, respect and professions, we have our own ethical standards and ethical cultures. For example, in medicine, uh, we have the, the standards biomedical ethics or medical ethics, or more general bioethics with, humans, uh, with human subjects. But what about their technicians? Computer ethics, robot ethics. So those are different type of ethics that now has to come to, to encounter um, to manage different type of uh, ethical challenges. If the Human Brain Project is not only doing basic neuroscientific research, but their, their main objective is to develop this ICT infrastructure for transnational research collaboration, it means that we have to share different data from different data sources, from which are coming from different cultural frameworks and legislations. For example, if we are doing um, animal research, which are our standards in animal ethics. Are those the same as in China, for example? Or, or countries that are com coming from other type of cultures? What about human rights issues? Uh, data protection issues? Privacy, confidentiality? So those are all big, big, big challenges that we have to manage in within their, the Human Brain Project and in our collaboration with other brain initiatives. So the Human Brain Project raised a, a huge amount of ethical questions that has to do with legal rights and obligations related to data management. It's, it's a part of those ethical issues. In neuroscience research, we have some ethical tools, classical research ethics. Research ethics, as, as you may know, uh, has, has been developed um, since the Nuremberg Code and uh, at the end of the Second World War. With, uh, with, with informed consent, the first article of the Nuremberg Code, and, and with different type of declarations, bioethical declarations, the Helsinki Declaration, the Belmont Report in the US, and in 2005, the, um, the UNESCO Universal Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights, 
the Convention of Human Rights, the European Convention. So we have different tools in neuroscientific research that has to do with, uh, with human subjects in research. Then there the, those researchers who are coming from their medical specialities, they are trained in medical ethics. But if we are working in neuro-ICT research, then we have another type of ethical cultures, which not, that are not similar as their bioethical or the human subjects in research or animal research. It has to do with data ethics, computer ethics, robot ethics. That doesn't mean that the medical doctors has, has more developed ethics as the engineers and technicians. It's only that we have different ethical cultures that has to encounter. Um, and as you may know, the, scientific, uh, the ethical scientific committees are mainly coming from biomedical field, not from the techni uh, technological fields. So in the Human Brain Project, we have a, a, a very interesting opportunity to develop a dialogical ethics, where we can encounter the different type of ethical characters. And we have legal issues that has to do with data protection, data governance, and compliance. So we have challenges with regards ethics, specific ethics, and with the, uh, the legal part of the research that we are doing, both in the neuroscientific research and in developing this um, neuro ICT research collaborative infrastructure. For doing this, there, as, as we have seen um, in the last uh, presentation, the Human Brain Project has developed um, some sub-projects that are focusing on neuroscientific research, others with the development of their uh, collaborative neuroacity research, and we have one sub-project which is specialized in ethical and social issues. And that's called the Ethic and Society sub-project. And um, we are working as the Human Brain Project is founded, is public funded, by Horizon 2020 and thereafter by a, a, a Europe um, research founding. Um, we are part of the Rems Responsible Research and Innovation Framework, which is working with, uh, with anticipation, uh, with reflection, and with public engagement, and with action. Those are the key the key messages of the Responsible Research and Innovation Framework. And we have a, a group who is working in, um, in King's College. Those are colleagues, sociologists and anth anthropologists who are working in the, in the Foresight Lab, doing anticipation of their, um, the, the future um, impact that the neuroscientific foundings will have in our society. And the Danish Board of Technology is working with public engagement. So it, it is uh, science for and with the society. And we have at Uppsala University the neuroethics and neurophilosophy team, who is working with uh, concepts for social and ethical and regulatory issues, and with huge philosophical questions that has to do with the human identity, for example. Uh, what is consciousness? Uh, how can we measure? Um, consciousness, consciousness. There are big, uh, which are their, their, the impacts of their, their emergent neurotechnologies on our um, understanding of who we are, what makes us human, etc. Um, issues that has philosophical issues that has to do with their uh, neurorobotics simulations, for example. And we have one group which is ethics support which is doing their ethical and, comp and legal compliance of the whole uh, project. Within this group, in ethics support, we have the ethics manager of the Human Brain Project. The ethics manager is part of the directorate of the Human Brain Project, so it, that, that's a, a signal uh, that, uh, that uh, the Human Project uh, gives um, an importance to, to the ethics in the, uh, within the project. We have their, um, the administration of their ethics advisory board. So the human project has three independent advice, advisory board, one scientific, the other clinic, and the third has to do with ethical issues. Uh, 
we have the, the data protection officer uh, in the ethics support team, animal ethicist, uh, Professor Gisten Mitchell, uh, who is collaborating from Harvard University uh, with bioethics. We have the compliance manager in ethics support team and um, data governance and dual use issues. I will comment soon on this. Um, one characteristic of the Human Brain Project is, is to embed ethics within the project from a bottom-up uh, bottom perspective. And that's something that uh, has been very, um, very interesting for the other research projects, the other big um, research projects uh, in, in the world. That we don't have here an, an ethical committee uh, we have an ombudsperson, for example, we have uh, this ethics advisory board, um, but each of the sub-projects has reporters. Th those are um, scientific scientifics or technicians uh, who are involved in the research and they are specializing in their own ethical field. So it's a type of applied ethics, but from within and from a bottom-up pers pers perspective. Uh, and it's different as, their, um, as the usual uh, research committee's perspective, that we have a research ethics body. Uh, we are only doing compliance and, and monitoring what the other are doing. Here, the researchers are doing their own reflections, and this ethics support team is supporting, giving support to those reflections. So we, who are ethicists, we are working with, their, with the researchers, but they are developing their own um, ethical uh, awareness from within the project with their colleagues, with their um, uh, team leaders, with their um, sub-projects managers, or with their research colleagues and um, PhD students. So that's something that is peculiar for the HBP. For data-related issues, within the ethics support team, we have uh, the data governance working group. Uh, which is similar as the ethics reporter uh, program. Those are, we have here the data governance working group and the data protection officer is part of this working group. The, the HBP directorate as well, the science of infrastructure. Um, is it, um, the data governance working group receive input from this ethics ad external ethics advisory board part of the ethics reporters are part of this data governance working group. We're working with their sub-projects managers. So everyone uh, is involved in the question of how, to, how do we handle social, legal, and ethical issues uh, with those different type of data that we have in the HBP. Which type of data? What characterizes the data use in the Human Brain Project? If we, un if we uh, understand that the HPP is concerned with different type of data, with the collection, processing, analysis, and dissemination of data, and this uh, effort of, this collaborative effort to doing um, um, brain research in collaboration with other countries and other continents and other cultures, um, we have different type of data use and ethical issues. The type of data that we have in the human project has to do with animal research, mainly rodent, fish, lower species, and non-human primate. Not so much non-human primate, but we are, we, uh, we are working with some data that um, involves non-human primate. Uh, with human, of course, both from research data and medical data personal biometric data, but also genetic, in vitro brain slices, cell lines, quantitative and qualitative data, patient and non-patient. And we have technical and simulation data. So the, the range is it's a wide range of different type of data. And, and the, those data are coming from in different formats, structured, unstructured, and multimedia data. And from different sources, from different countries mainly from HBP-funded countries, but also from non-HBP-funded, for example, from the Allen Institute, as we hear, 
and also some, some from, from, from Asia, from EU and non-EU countries. So that, that, that's the type of data that we have in the Human Project, Human Brain Project. Here are ethical issues by data type, and um, you will have their presentation, so then you can uh, look at that in, in more detail. And if, if we are working with non-technical data, so technical data is uh, curated in the sub-project five and in, in Oslo, but what about animal and human data? We have developed different standard operation procedures, the so-called SOPs, which regulates within the Human Brain Project how we manage the different type of data, animal and human. In animal data, there are non-human primates, genetically modified data, um, and let's see, let's see in detail uh, uh, which type of animal data we are using in our ethical, ethical um, principles. So animal data within the, the Human Brain Project follows the EU regulations, ethical regulations on, uh, on animals. So animal um, has an intrinsic value and um, we have to satisfy their well-being and doing research with them, protecting, protecting the animals. So model organism research is strictly regulated. The standard is very high in the EU. In order to be approved research with animals within the Human Brain Project, it has shown that uh, the research is following the EU ethical principles, principles that lay out in H Horizon 2020 ethics self-assessment documentation. It is a self-assessment self survey that the researcher has to uh, fill in with, uh, with questions about the type of research they are doing with animals. Um, particularly, the EU directive uh, on protection of animals is used uh, within the, the Human Brain Project. They are different, we, we are working with different countries, so there are different standards and um, there are countries that member states that have stricter rules um, the principle in the HVP is that the institution, the country, has to follow the country's um, uh, regulations and rules. So, for example, here in, in, in Austria, they had to follow the Austrian, Austrian rules, the same as in Sweden or in Spain or in Portugal. So it's the institution and the country uh, which shows the standard, the ethical standards within the EU. Researchers must comply with the rules of the jurisdic jurisdiction where they operate. So the ethics support team uh, try to follow how the institution, the researcher or the research team, the lab, is complying to their, their own jurisdictions where the research team is operating. The principles that we are following are, are the, the, the classical now in animal ethics that has to do with the so-called three R's, replacement, reduction, and refinement. Now we have in the HPP that's recently an animal uh, uh, research coordinator placed in Linnaeus University in Sweden. Um, Replacing has to do with replacing animal use by an alternative method or test testing strategy. Reduction, reduce the number of animals used um, without losing the statistical power. And refinement, improving the breeding, accommodation, and care of animals. So it has to do with the well-being of the animals. What about the non-EU animal data? And that's, that's an ethical challenge for the HBP and for this whole effort of collaboration within different um, regions of the world. Animal data from third countries is recognized as a potential area of ethical concerns. The HBP strives to follow the highest EU standards regarding animal data. So the principle is um, to ask that the researchers, the labs, 
who are coming from non-EU countries follows the standards that we have in, in EU. You have, when you get the presentation, you have the link there to the non-EU animal data SOP. Human data, that's the, the other type of data that we have in the Human ba Brain Project. Um, human data consists of personal data and human biological materials, as we have seen in, in other presentations. We are working with organs, parts of organs, cells and tissues. Um, and other type of material from living and deceased human beings that generates personal in information. We will then see the difference between different type of human data. Human data is regulated in different sets of legislation, but most human data generates personal data and that has a, a special treatment. Uh, and pers uh, personal data is information that can be linked to a natural person. Yes. Personal data is now regulated by the GD GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which replaced the directive that we had before in, the, in Europe. With humans, with human subjects in research, with this uh, data that are coming from, from human, patient or non-patient, uh, the researcher have to comply with informed consent. That has to do with this uh, biomedical um, research principles from the Nuremberg Code uh, until now. So data collected from human beings must have been collected according to the ethical principle governing research in the EU. Uh, the researcher has, has, has to provide evidence that the data subject consented to the procedure undertaken to collect the data that the data subject consented the use of the data for the research purposes. Where known consent for data sharing is available, the use of data must be legal according to EU data protection legislation. Um, this, is, this is not so easy um, in, in, in doing research. Um, but this principle apply both experimental data collected from volunteers and to medical and patient data. And here is the, is there, um, it's a flow chart about our informed consent standard operation procedure in the human uh, brain project. So when a researcher has plans involving patients, children, uh, healthy volunteers or vulnerable groups for those apply special um, procedures, they had to, to show, to, to get the local ethics approvals in their institution, so they, the, their, the local institution with the local country uh, is, gives the approval, not the ethics support team in the Human Brain Project, it's the institution. And then the ethics support team or ethics management checks the documentation, store it, and uh, can show it to the European Commission. And this is the compliance process with, human, with uh, informed consent in the HVP. And then the research can begin. So it relies in the researcher's own um, institution and country. Uh, and they have to show evidence that they got the local permission, the local ethics approval. And um, here we have the distinction between different type of human data, personal, anonymous, and sensitive data. Personal data are either identifiable or indirectly identifiable data. It has to do that if you can, we can trace uh, the person that, um, with any factor, physical, physiological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural, or social identity of that natural uh, person. Anonymous data are not considered personal information and cannot be linked to a natural person. So that this distinction is important because uh, if we have uh, anonymous data, then we don't uh, have to have the informed consent. What we personal data, where we can trace the person, we have always have to have the consent. 
Sensitive data are information relating to ethnic background, political opinions, philosophical or religious beliefs, health, sexual health, trade, union membership, etc. Uh, sensitive data is subject of regulation of confidentiality. So when we need informed consent, um, when the, the, the data is not anonymous. But anonymous is not the same as pseudonymization. And it's, very, it's not so easy to, to, to anonymize data. Uh, so the recommendation is always try to have their, the consent. It can be a progressive consent, different type of, of, of uh, consent. Health data is collected from patients at hospital for diagnosis purposes and is regulated by legislations concerning health personnel and their duty to confidentiality. That's a, an important distinction because the relation, it can be the same person, but uh, when the researcher or the person, the individual is in, is in the role of the researcher in the relationship to a research subject, or when the individual is in the role of the of their physician, the medical, related to a patient. So they, there are different type of relations. And, um, and here, if, if the relation is uh, a medical relation, then it's a health data. And this follows the Helsinki Declaration. Um, and uh, we pay special attention to medical research with vulnerable groups. Uh, with children, with poor, with um, um, stigmatized populations or persons, um, etc. Um, those are the, the, the more typical issues that has to do with, with data uh, in, within their, the HBP and in relation to other countries. But we have some emergent new issues that needs our attention and awareness. Let me show you a very short video on this. We do groundbreaking research on the nervous system, on information and communication technology, and in robotics and artificial intelligence. Because we are funded by the European Union, we are only allowed to do non-military research. But some of our research has the potential for dual use and may be of interest to the military. Dual use of research is when research and innovation designed for civilian use can also be used for military purposes. History shows that science and engineering originally intended for civilian use has contributed to new military applications in ways that were not initially foreseen. At the same time, most of us use and rely on technologies that originated from military research, from large to small scale applications. It is difficult to ensure our research will not be used for military purposes. We can't control what will happen once it has been made public, or we might not know or realize it has the potential for dual use. Does it matter how the research results are used and by whom? And if so, what should we do about it? We would like to know what you think and how you feel about research with potential dual use. Well, this is a, a short video which is prepared from the, uh, the Danish Board of Technology. Uh, they are working with public engagement and um, in communication with different stakeholders and the population in general in Europe. There are concerns, uh, legitimate concerns about the use of their neuro neuroscientific research results. And as we have seen, if we are working in, in the framework of responsible research and innovation, we have to anticipate the effects, the impact of our research. But what about the dual use, the unintended use of our results for um, military or uh, security, uh, social control, different type of uses, which was not intended in the research project. That's an emergent issue. Now, the, the HBP is working now, uh, have built our dual use working group, uh, similar as the data governance uh, working group. And uh, we are discussing within the project how to manage the, first, how can we identify the potential dual use of concern issues, and then how, have, how 
we can handle, how we can manage, manage them. And uh, this imposes different tensions, uh, interesting, interesting tensions, but that we have to, to solve. For example, if we are working in the framework of responsible uh, research and innovation, one key issue has to do with open science. But if we are talking about dual use, how can we relate dual use to open science? Yes, and with the, with, the, with the research infrastructure, which will be open, as we have seen, you can now visit the collaboratory. Um, what about the dual use issues? So this ethics and society sub-project has developed an opinion is, uh, about these issues, an opinion on responsible dual use, political security intelligence, and military research of concerns in neuroscience and neurotechnology, with recommendations for the HBP and for the European Union, and also uh, has developed an opinion on data protection and privacy. Um, so the HBP is committed with responsible research and innovation, um, and is very aware about the different type of ethical issues that emerge from the type of data and the sources of data, but also of, from this uh, emergent uh, new ethical issues. Now a new ethical issue will has, has to do with artificial intelligence, for example. Uh, you may have seen um, on, on the papers and on Twitter um, a, a, a very huge amount of um, guidelines, standards, propositions, how can we have a responsible artificial intelligence or uh, ethics by design and has to do uh, with, with this no new artificial intelligence uh, technologies. Um, the HBP uh, is developing in, in their own artificial as well. They're working with, uh, um, with machine learning and have that, that means that if we have this issue, we will have to, to think about it and have an opinion and our own standards for uh, a responsible artificial intelligence. So ethics is something that it's, uh, it's never ending. It has to do m with reflection more than in compliance. We have to be compliant with the legal minimums that we have, of course, but ethics is a reflection, an ongoing reflection, um, an, an open dialogue. And, and here I have some, some papers that I, I could recommend if you're interested in these issues uh, that relates to uh, ethical reflection and from the experience from the Human Brain Project. Um, one has to do beyond research ethics, dialogues in neuro ICT research. There's a paper uh, from the ethics support team uh, which discuss with the classic research ethics and uh, offers a new perspective. How can we work together uh, different dif disciplines uh, from an ethical perspective? In the second paper, the, the Human Brain Project, Responsible Brain Research for the Benefit of Society, that is an, was a special issue uh, from Neuron. And in, in this issue, you can find reflections from the different huge brain initiatives in the world. And this is the, the, the part of the Human Brain Project. And then uh, we have the data, data policy manual. There you can have the different definitions that we have um, visited uh, during the presentation. 